Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Welcome to ATL Startup Village, where you get to hear incredible founders making a dent in the universe. Uh-oh. I hear T-Unders is putting on my song. Oh! We are so excited tonight. We're so excited for you to be here. I'm your host, Christian Ross. This is your co-host. Kristen Slink. Not sure why I gave her the microphone again, <laughs> but we showcase the innovation here that is coming out of Atlanta. There's so many amazing companies every single day that are building, and especially right here in Atlanta Tech Village. So we want to say thank you, first of all, to Atlanta Tech Village for being our perpetual sponsor where we can come. And whose first time is it here? Please raise your hand. All right. Oh, Welcome. We should have a t-shirt for one of you. Stay tuned. Only one, okay? Um, but tonight, you are going to hear from companies offering solutions that you need to know about. And right now, tonight's special, Kristen. I know, and I was talking to a lot of you, and you didn't even realize it. So I think that we need to talk about why yeah. tonight's so special. It's a very special evening. Mm -hmm. Tonight is the pitch off. So as my friend Sebastian, I just saw him, said, he said, these are the winners of the winners. <laughs> That's really what he said. He sounds just like that, too. <laughs> he did. <laughs> The folks over here to the left have been in this room over the past year, and they have won in the audience favorite. So now we have all of the audience favorites back again to pitch for you to decide who takes home the grand prize of two hot desks and parking right here in Atlanta Tech Village, valued at $13,000. Woo! What a value. I mean, I don't know anyone giving away anything right now. So especially to know that you can come on stage, earn this is amazing. This is a place for entrepreneurs. We invite you to continue to look at Eventbrite. There's so many amazing things such as, um, like we just had something with using no code and AI. And there's stuff with attorneys here. And there's just so many different events you can come to. And every other Friday, there is startup show, excuse me, startup chow down, where you can come and eat, have lunch, 10 bucks, pay at the front, get lunch, network. And then there's also pitch practice every Friday at 1 p.m. So if you're a founder in the room, raise your hand if you're a founder, or if you're thinking about, great. Ooh. You're thinking about something, come here at 1 p.m. on Friday and pitch in that room right behind you. Sometimes when there's so many people, it'll be right in this room and there'll be as many people as we see right now. So we're so excited to have you here. We are so excited for Vino Barrel, our sponsor, and um, they're wheeling it in right now. The beer is on side, so you can always <laughs> slip one out. But first, we are going... Wait, before we go any yes. further, because yes. there's so many new people here, I want to talk about the format really quick. Please, so thank you. So you, as the audience, get to ask any clarifying questions to those who are pitching to understand their business model a little bit more. So this gives you the power to dive a little bit deeper into the model. So if you hear something and you're like, wait a second, I want to know more about that. Well, that would be a great question. And the more questions that we can ask these founders about their business, the more ammo that they have to be able to explain it. And we're timed. Yes. Five, five minutes. minutes. So five minutes worth of questions. And the other thing that's amazing about this group as well is that they are all in the marketplace right now. So all of them have have customers, they are in the marketplace, so they're gonna be sharing where they're at right now and where they're going. All right. Okay. Are we ready? We're ready. Are you guys ready? I like that. I a, little, a little, a little bit stronger than that. Come on. She said woo. <laughs> yes. So who do we have up first? First. Da -da -da -da. Carpool Logistics. Coming up. And this is also awesome reminder, stay to the end because the vote does not go up on the board until the very end at the last pitch. Just FYI. I'm Mike Malikov, founder of Carpool. 
consumers are ready to buy cars online and the entire automotive industry is shifting towards digital. Dealerships and auto auctions want to build an omni-channel solution where they can sell in the brick and mortar or online. Con OEMs want to go direct to consumer. All the electric vehicle companies are direct to consumer, avoiding the dealership step. One of the challenges they all face is that shipping a car is an absolute disaster. I don't know if any of you guys have shipped a car before, but you can't track it. You don't know when it's getting picked up. You don't know when it's going to deliver. It's just a black hole. It's extremely inefficient. You have 40% of car haulers moving around with at least one empty space. You can order socks online, yet you can track a $50,000 car that you just purchased, creating a very unreliable customer experience. At Carpool, we pull cars. We create a more efficient way of shipping vehicles. We bundle multiple customer shipments together and create better transparency through our platform, creating a much better predictable customer experience, helping us reduce costs up to 20%, reduce emissions, and create a better transparency for all of our customers. In a short amount of time, we've only been in business two years, we have about 700 plus customers signed up on our platform and over 5,500 carriers on our platform. As you can see, there's about 160 plus thousand dealerships and auto auctions in the United States. And there's over 20,000 auto haulers in the United States. So we're not even scratching the surface. Entire space is about 22 billion. We initially started going after auto auctions and then expanded to the dealership segment with the goal to expand into other verticals like the OEMs, digital marketplaces, consumers, our platform enables us to bundle cars more efficiently and enables us to track vehicles in transit, document the condition of the car before it's picked up and after it's delivered, creating a much more reliable experience for, for our customers. Traction. In a short amount of time, we've gained some amazing traction. As I mentioned, we have a 700 plus customers signed up. We're doing, uh, we'll do about 2.2 million this quarter. In June, we're pacing to do about 950,000 in top line revenue, which translates into about 150,000 in net revenue. You can see some big names on the, on, on the screen. We've signed up CarMax, we've signed up uh, Lithia Motors, which is the second largest dealership group in the United States, and we have some really good traction with some of our accounts. Our initial target was we wanted to see, can we gain traction without any technology? And that's what we did in the beginning, 2001, uh, 2021 and 22, we focused on gaining traction, just spreadsheets and just going after it. In 2022 and 2023, we spent building our platform. So we built our platform from scratch. We internally utilized our transportation management system. Uh, we built tools for our customers so they can track vehicles in transit. And then all our transporters on the platform have a mobile app and also a web portal where they can log in and bid on shipments. Uh, so. Our goal is to accelerate our journey in 2024-27 uh, and really build it up to a $150 million business. We initially bootstrapped it with $300,000 co-founder investment and we raised a $2 million seed round with Atlanta Ventures last summer. Our goal is to raise an $8 million Series A later this fall or early next spring. Our co-founding team, we have executives with startup experience building companies from scratch, software development experience, and supply chain experience. So we really combined all the expertise we require to build this platform. Thank you. We look to connect with investors that are interested in automotive and logistics tech. Audience, you have five minutes for questions. Yes, please. Yeah, so just scroll back to that. So the way it works is we're a marketplace. Repeat the question. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. How do we, what are the expenses of the top line revenue and what is the net revenue ex explanation? So the way we charge is per car, distance of the transport and as well as what's, what, what size of the vehicle. And then we, um, basically our cost 
of goods is what we pay the transporter. The top line is what we charge our customer, then we uh, deduct that from with the transporter, we pay the transporter, and we retain a margin in between. So initially, we just did it just pounding phones. Uh, how did, uh, so this application requires a lot of technology to be able to track vehicles in transit, all of that. How do we do that initially? So initially, it was literally our team making phone calls, tracking down drivers. When was it picked up? When was it delivered? That was in the early days. Now we have a platform that enables us to do all those things automatically. So uh, through our mobile app, we can, you know, we can track when the driver's picked up the vehicles. We, he gives us ETA through, this, through the mobile app when it's getting picked up. Uh, we can track the condition of the cars because they have to take pictures uh, before and after. So we know what condition the vehicles were in before they were picked up and after they were delivered. So we can track the journey through the mobile app. That comes into our system and automatically transports into our customer's portal so they can get the visibility throughout the entire process. Yes, please. Oh, that, so what keeps me up at night? So it, it, it varies, right? It's a, we're startups, so you're wearing like multiple hats constantly. Uh, kind of uh, towards the COVID days, it was, we couldn't find talent fast enough. That was one of the biggest challenges we were facing, that we were, had an opportunity to grow faster, but we couldn't because we couldn't find talent. So that was a challenge. Um, now, obviously, like the economy is, uh, you know, where, where is the economy going, right? For us, it's worked out pretty well because the demand for cars has been really high through COVID, and the supply of cars through COVID has been really low. So consumers are sitting on, you know, average age of a car is 12 years, which is the highest it's ever been. So a lot of those clunkers are going to have to get cycled out of the system. It's good for us. Uh, and that also, COVID also opened up for consumers to buy more cars online. So that all those things kind of helped us. Um, but yeah, it's, it's constantly evolving. Thank you. <laughs> you got to be optimistic. It's a roller coaster, though. Yes, please. Absolutely. So the question is, are there any competitors in the market? Yeah, we did not invent shipping cars. Our goal is to make it, the process more seamless, more transparent, give customers better experience. That's really the full thing that we're focused on. And we want to deliver that through our technology, give you know, our customers better transparency through our portal. Because trying to do this manually, and a lot of our competitors do this manually like we did with the spreadsheets, it, it's not scalable. And we, you know, we have scalable plans. Sebastian. Great question. So Sebastian's asking, how long does it take us to pay out the transporters on our platform? And you know, what's the process? So one of the enticing things that we've built out through our platform, if the, the transporter utilizes our portal, uh, our uh, mobile app, and gives us the full visibility, they get paid within 48 hours, no fee charged, which is unknown in the industry. Generally, they get paid 15 days. If they get paid in two days, they get charged 3 to 5% fee of the, the revenue. We don't charge a fee. Uh, and we make that process su super transparent. That we don't need an invoice. Literally, just have to document the condition of the car, process through the, the entire application throughout a mobile app. We're already directly connected to their bank account, so we've built an integration with our bank. So ACH is automatically transferred to their account. So we make it really seamless for the transporter, which is very sticky for them to use us. And we want to build that ecosystem for us to utilize us constantly. All right. Thank you so much. Questions are up. Thank you so much. Yeah, give it up. All right, next up is Strapped. And in the meantime, I brought a t-shirt. And we have chairs over here so the people who came in, come on over. Take All a right. seat. All right, so the question to get the t-shirt, I want a show of hands. Listen to the whole thing first. Show of hands if this is your first time here and you either consider yourself a founder or you are, want to be a founder. All right. Oh, snag by the lady with the cool red hair. Ow, ow. You ready? 
All right. Next up, next up is Strapped. Woo, let's give it up. Round of applause for Strapped, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Carly Simenauer. I am the founder and CEO of Strapped, where we're expanding access to period and personal care by changing the way that consumer products are marketed to consumers. Now, I started Strapped a little over two years ago after a very frustrating experience with one of these very familiar, crusty old tampon dispensers. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you all that, of course it didn't work, because they never do. These things have been left to rot on walls for decades. And the reason for that, it's actually pretty simple. These machines were built on an old model and an old system that doesn't incentivize the right parties to participate. On one hand, you have the facilities who we expect to purchase and maintain these dispensers. They're not making enough money to justify the hassle of offering programs like these, and they're not legally obligated to, so they don't. On the other side of the equation, you have today's brands and products who physically cannot fit inside of today's dispensers without making significant product mod packaging modifications, which is expensive, and which is why we don't see any of these products in today's machines. So between crappy products inside of machines that don't work, of course women don't use them. But you can imagine that tons of brands are dying to get in front of consumers at this exact point of need, and not just the feminine hygiene brands. Because the consumer packaged goods industry as a whole is large, it's growing, it's becoming more distributed, and it's moving predominantly online, which means that a lot of these brands just don't have the same opportunities to meet consumers in real life, which is where they're often most effective. And instead, they're fighting for digital ad space in a world that is already incredibly oversaturated. And the reality is, without a way to try a product before you buy, and especially a personal product, it's really difficult to get a consumer to make the shift on digital alone. They need to try it for themselves. And trial is a highly effective way of converting consumers. But the way it's done today, it's manual, it's expensive, um, it's uncontrolled, and there's no data in it. So it's strapped. What we're doing is automating sampling as a way to connect CPGs with their target consumers at the perfect time and place. And we're doing this by providing the platform for consumers to sample the products that they need, where they need them, when they need them, and in a way that incentivizes all stakeholders to get on board. For our users, it's obvious. They're getting access to free, high quality, high need products at the perfect time and place. And because they're no longer having to pay for these products, we're seeing them engage at incredibly high rates, which in turn generates incredibly powerful data in the process. Our facilities, they're now getting these machines for free and all of the product inside for free, which makes them incredibly easy to place. And for our brands, we're giving many of them their very first channel into public restrooms and other private spaces because for the first time ever, they have machines that can actually support their products. We're no longer limited to just the massive players like Tampax and Trojan. We allow virtually any feminine hygiene brand and thousands of other products to participate without making any sort of packaging modifications. And on top of allowing access to all of these awesome up and coming brands, We've also built our platform in a way that provides complete transparency into how these brands' products and campaigns are performing. Ultimately, our goal is to use this data to help them understand exactly what it takes to move a customer all the way from the point of trial to the point of purchase. Now, as I've alluded to, we flipped the old model of vending on its head so that our customer is no longer the end user, it's no longer the facility, but instead the brand whose product that we vend and market. For every dispenser that they occupy, we charge them a monthly sponsorship fee. 
that varies based on the location of the dispenser that they're in. And we're targeting locations that are conducive to a $500 or more monthly um, sponsorship fee. Um, what that means is that at a $300 per unit cost, our machines pay for themselves in under one month. So we've taken an industry that has traditionally been incredibly capital intensive and not only found a way to manufacture at a very low cost, but we found a way to serve a market with much higher growth potential in a much more scalable way. To date, we've deployed close to 40 machines throughout Atlanta, including one here at ATV. Uh, that have dispensed over 15,000 products. And within the next two weeks, we'll have grown our footprint 40% with our deployment of 15 units at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. We've also got uh, over 160 units in the pipeline um, at premium facilities like FedEx Field, Ghirardelli Square, CBRE Shopping Centers. Uh, and so we are raising a 500K pre-seed round um, in order to fill these orders and onboard new brands. Um, this is our team. This is the group that makes it happen. Again, I'm Carly Simenauer. I'm working alongside incredibly talented group of individuals, including Jose Morales, our mechanical engineer, Siobhan Riggins, marketing director, Stas Radomovich, and Arthur Matson, our firmware and electrical engineers. So with that said, I'd love to open this up for questions. Thank you. That is a great question. So the question is, how often do you restock and who does the restocking? And something in there about remote inventory monitoring, which is crucial to, um, to our solution. Because we can actually monitor inventory on the back end, we no longer have to send people to the machines two or three times a day to check whether they're stocked or not. Instead, Strap sends notifications to maintenance crews that are already on site, letting them know that it's time to service a machine. Um, so to answer the second part of the question, it's the maintenance crews on site of the facilities that we're in that we're leaning on to support these machines. And at a, a zero cost investment for them, they're, they're very, very willing to do that. Thank you. So our machines pay for themselves in under one month. Can you please um, repeat the yes, question? Yes, sorry. How quickly, thank you, how quickly um, does it take to recoup the cost of, um, of your machine based on our business model? Um, so at 500 units, our machines cost $300 per unit to manufacture. Um, we're targeting locations that's, that allow us to um, charge $500 per machine per month. Am I missing the question? Okay, so like how many customers need to convert for it to make sense for them? It varies uh, to be, or, yeah, so how many customers does it make sense or how many customers need to convert for it to make sense for the brands to get on board? Um, and that varies based on the brand that we're working with. We could be working with a feminine hygiene brand and they've got to see a lot of customers convert to recoup the cost of their investment. That said, Customers of feminine hygiene brands are typically lifelong customers or you know, throughout the period of time that they use those products. So they're seeing larger lifetime value um, of those conversions. Uh, let's say we were to have a company like Chanel sponsor our machines. We can't dispense handbags, but say, say we could, it would only take them what, you know, half a, half a conversion to recoup their investment. So it really does vary. Yes, we are. Um, are we capturing the buyer information? I thought I was going to be so much better at repeating the question. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I really thought I did include this very important. Oh, here we go. OK. Um, yes, we are. So the way that the process works is the user walks up to our machine. They scan the QR code. And at this point, they're prompted to enter um, to authenticate within our app. They can do this through Facebook, Google, 
Apple login. It's very easy, it takes under 10 seconds to complete. Um, but in that way, we're able to capture some of their information um, and also similarly prevent someone from standing at the machine and emptying it out in one sitting. What we don't want is one person to, you know, sample over and over and over again the same product. We want our partners to, um, to see the largest possible reach of unique users. Mm -hmm. um, so how did we get to the $500 fee? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, originally, I kind of started out by thinking about this on a Per sampling, um, a per sample cost, which in the market is anywhere from probably a buck fifty to three dollars, without capturing any sort of information. Um, like I said, the sponsorship fee does vary by location, but we're kind of using that rule of thumb and using the estimated foot traffic to put that price point on each machine, and then bumping it up a little bit because we're actually able to provide transparency into the sampling process. Are we asking our users to give up all of their data and private information in exchange for a tampon? And we're out of time. <laughs> can, I, can I answer that? OK. Um, no, we're not asking them to give up all of their information. And we don't, we don't collect and analyze information at the personal level. We don't share um, information beyond the, the authentication that you do for pretty much every app that you use. Um, we do require user to consent into our process, um, but we do have very strict data practices and truly do respect the privacy of our users. Let's All give right. it up for Strapped. Awesome job. Good questions, you guys. Yeah, those are great questions. I love it too, the fact that she was like, the question was, oh, well, what do you do? And she was like, oh, we deploy this team. And for a lot of founders, it's like, I do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually the answer is, I do it. So, <laughs> Wearing all the hats. Yes. Yeah. So we're very excited. Is that like Shaft in the background coming? OK. Maybe not. I know. He's like grooving. He's like, yeah. So I dig it. I like it. I keep going. We have uh, Jax coming up to the stage right now. They're setting up. Are you? All right. Ooh, welcome, Jax. All right, give it up. I'm Julius Bryant, co-founder and CEO of Jax, a car rental marketplace helping to remove vehicle access as a barrier of entry to gig work. Before I dive in, I want to give you a quick uh, idea of our traction. We've been able to prove our value in the market, evident more than 30,000 unique rental days, more than $180,000 in monthly revenue, and most importantly, more than 500 jobs created for gig workers across our two markets in Atlanta, Georgia, and Dallas, Texas. I want to introduce you to Jada. Jada is a 34-year-old mother of two who recently relocated to Atlanta for a fresh start. She doesn't own a car, and she spends about 30 minutes on a bus each way to and from her part-time job, where she just barely makes enough money to support her and her two kids. She liked to drive for Uber or Lyft to make some extra money, but because she doesn't have a car, she doesn't have that option. To address this opportunity and to solve this problem for people like Jada, Jax has created a car rental marketplace, connecting rideshare and delivery drivers that lack vehicle access to fleet owners like dealerships that have idle or underutilized vehicles, removing vehicle access as a barrier of entry to the gig economy. Here's a quick bottoms up look at the market opportunity for Jax. So in America alone, there are about 2.7 million gig workers across the largest ride sharing and delivery platforms. Of those, about 15% or 400,000 are using vehicles that they don't own to do their jobs as ride share and delivery drivers. At an 85% vehicle utilization rate and a $59 average per day rental fee, that amounts to a $7.3 billion market opportunity. That same market is projected to grow to more than 12 billion by the year 2030. The model is simple. Fleet owners like dealerships and rental car agencies can list their excess vehicle inventory on the JAX platform. Uh, gig workers can then browse and book those vehicles on the JAX platforms, pick the vehicle up from the owners, and then immediately start using them to earn income through gig work. 
Jax retains anywhere from 30 to 40% of the rental revenue with the remainder going directly to the owner of the vehicle. Now through uh, surveying we've done, we've learned that 96% of our customers are earning more income now, even after paying a rental fee than they were in their previous employment before renting a vehicle from Jax. They're also saving about five hours per week that they used to spend riding public transit to and from their part-time jobs. So a quick look at our revenue. So we did just over $1 million in total revenue last year. Um, we're tracking for $5.6 million this year. Uh, really low acquisition costs at just $4 and a lifetime value at over $1,300. And the average rental period right now is about 64 days per customer. Quick look at our team. So we have deep expertise across uh, technology and mobility at companies like Amazon, Hertz, Get Around, and Lyft, as well as the exit of another startup. Uh, recently brought on our first uh, advisor, his name's Adam Carley, co-founder at Clutch, a uh, vehicle subscription platform that was acquired by Cox Automotive. So we have a really big vision. We're building it out in real time. Uh, Earlier this year, we launched the first version of what we call the JAX Hub. So this is a one-stop shop where fleet owners like dealerships can do things like verify the identity of the drivers who are in their vehicles, uh, inspect the vehicles for safety, track the maintenance records on those vehicles, as well as manage and monitor unit level profitability. So we have uh, kind of a two-pronged mission. The first part of that is no driver left behind. So no matter where you live in the country, whether or not you own a vehicle or not, you should be able to drive uh, for a gig platform if you desire to. And then the second one is eliminating vehicle waste. So we have parking lots all over America that have vehicles sitting in them that are idle and depreciating. And we want to take those vehicles and make use of them. Uh, we're raising a $2 million seat round right now. Um, so we'll primarily use those funds to hire continue iterating on our product, and then do marketing to get our product in the hands of customers all over the country. Um, our plan is to get to four markets by the end of the year, 5.6 uh, in total GMV, and then $2 million in net revenue. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the problem, the question was, uh, how do we handle insurance? So we have a master policy that we are able to add and remove drivers to and from on a daily basis. Um, that insurance policy covers the vehicles when it's in, in uh, what's called period zero. So that is um, essentially when a vehicle is not being used on any gig platform. The second that vehicle is on Uber, Lyft, or a delivery platform, um, those platforms will provide the insurance for the driver. So our insurance policy covers that period where the driver is not using it for one of the gig platforms. Well, so we kind of got lucky that we were based here in Atlanta. Atlanta. Atlanta happens to be the number one market in the country for uh, gig rentals. Uh, a lot of factors uh, factor into it. As you know, we don't have great mass transit here, heavy reliance on vehicles. Uh, so we kind of looked for other cities that, uh, that mirrored that in, in certain ways. Uh, also, we looked for cities where the drivers actually make enough to be able to afford to rent a vehicle and still put money in their pockets. And Dallas was one of those cities. I missed part of that. They, they're not letting people. So Uber, so what you're talking about is actually for passenger and commuter rentals. So if I flew into New York, sorry, the question was uh, Uber also rents vehicles and how do we compete? Um, the program you were talking about is for passenger and commuter vehicles. So if I go to New York City and I need a, a car to get around for a few days, it's comparable to a Hertz or Enterprise. I think that's the program you're talking about. Uber also does have a program that they allow workers to rent vehicles from them and use them to, to earn income. The biggest difference between us and then a platform like that through Uber is that we're platform agnostic. So we don't have any limitations on uh, what platform you can use the vehicle for. If you rent from Uber, they lock you into their ecosystem because they take uh, out of the earnings, they use the earnings to pay for your car, right? With us, we're platform agnostic. The drivers pay up front, and you can use the, plat the vehicle for any platform and ultimately earn more income.
Yes. So we're strictly, uh, the question was um, companies like Hire Car and others in the space, they do more peer-to-peer -peer rentals, and she's asking if we're strictly working with companies. The answer is yes. The reason for that is peer-to-peer -peer is really not the best use case for uh, when you have a gig worker renting a vehicle. For example, you have 100 individuals, you have 100 different vehicles uh, from those 100 individuals, and there's there's a, a high level of difficulty when you talk about quality control, right? Making sure that uh, the tires have enough tread on them and that the brakes are in good working condition and things like that. So we're specifically working with companies, primarily dealerships that have on-site mechanics, uh, body shops and things like that, that can make sure the vehicles are in good, safe working condition before they go out on a rental. Yeah, the question was how do we convince dealerships to rent out their cars through our platform as opposed to somewhere else? The number one thing is utilization. So our utilization right now is sitting at 98%. So the cars are virtually always rented. So when you have a, a vehicle that goes on a platform like Turo, for example, Turo is more geared toward the weekend traveler. Someone comes in town, needs a car for a few days, and then the car sits there for a few days every week. With us, once that car is picked up, 98% of the time is going to be out on a rental, and that same car is going to be out 64 days um, on a rental on, on average as opposed to three or four on two rows. So ultimately, the economics work better for the fleet owner. And I think I have time for one more. Yeah, so the question was, is there math that says that renting a vehicle out is better than ultimately selling a vehicle, right? Is that the question? Yeah, so um, the profit margins are anywhere from 40 to 50% if you can rent that vehicle over a nine-month period of time. Um, in many instances, you see for, from a used car perspective, a lot of times they're barely making any money, sometimes 5 or 10% margin um, on a used vehicle, so we're able to eclipse that through rental. Oh my gosh, Kristen, all these smart people. They're so good. You guys so have such many. a hard decision to make. And it's audience, your like hands. your questions are so good. Yeah, thank you. Oh, good. Um, let's give it up for DJ Tiandris in the back. Oh, oh. She's rocking the in-between. Keeping us going. All right, we've got some more shirts. Yes. First and foremost, there's this lovely shirt that I personally donated. This is what a founder looks like. This is what a founder looks like. So what question do we want to ask for someone to get this shirt? What did you learn this month that you would like to share with everyone here? What did you Ooh. learn that impacted you this month? Anything that like laid something on your mind, heart, your body? You guys aren't learning? All yeah. right. Okay. I'm coming back for you, Precious. I'm coming back for you. Sometimes you need to decide to move across the country in a week for a new job. Oh. Is that what you just did? Yes. Nice. Welcome. Yes, this is great. That's a support entrepreneur's t-shirt. Where you, where'd you come from? Hey, it's where my mom's from. Welcome, Welcome. to the community. Welcome. All right. I just told him about this shirt and you gave him another one. I'm so sorry. I, I did. <laughs> I did do that. All right, I did you got do another that. question? Oh, okay. He's like, my hands are raised. All right. Uh, so for me, I would say, um, I learned that sometimes, you know, you don't really know what people go through unless you, you know, you are in their shoes. There you go. Make sure you put yourself that. in someone's shoes. Yes. Always give grace. That is, yes. I'm glad you got that t-shirt, sir. Let's give it up for Merchant.ai. And we're sitting down. All right, come on, raise your hands. Let's give it up. Give him some energy. Thank you, thank you. Check, check. My name is Charles Liscom. I'm a co-founder and the CEO of Merch Shop AI. I'm very excited to be back here at the Startup Village. And the last time we were on this stage, we were right out of the box. We only had our problem statement, our solution statement, what we were dreaming to build and building by hand. Today, we've brought a live demo of our SaaS platform, and I'm excited to show it to you today. The founding team is made up of myself, an industry veteran, generation, 
And our operations lead is here today as well. I'd love to introduce him. He moved his entire family and his life from another country and gave up a business that he had bootstrapped to millions of dollars because he believed in this problem and what we're building together. And uh, hopefully you guys agree. Previously, we reached into the audience and we tried to create an understanding in brand and merchandise because we do. We deliver branded goods. You can go on your phone and you can order custom food to your exact specification on a number of solutions, an excellent customer experience. The pizza ordered right now will be delivered before the vote goes live. But that exact same experience, the technology barriers and all the excuses that exist in the branded space, they're just not there. We have been using off-the-shelf tools to the best of our ability the premier Shopify platform, we've thrown money at the Magentos, the WooCommerce, the SaaS platforms that are out there, and they just can't meet the needs of a custom branded store. You can do it for enterprise customers, and we do. We have a bit of monthly revenue that we're really proud of, but it's a bespoke process. It's mainly akin to consulting, and while we have been serving these customers and getting these rave reviews, we've been building the SaaS program that I'm here to show. We randomly selected four companies from the audience to show on our live demo. So let's just, let's just get crazy and pick one, you know? Let's just say we're gonna do one real quick, so we'll go right now with Quickie. So this skipped the password page because I wanted to cache everything, but from the very beginning, as you see on the screen, you're gonna have a very different emotional response to a branded store that's available with my newsfeed for Don, right here. Our combined AI suite of technologies and all of the ML work that we're doing are still getting better and better, but overall they're curating a bespoke feel, a decoration, visualization of the products that you can have, and everything that we've done here on our SaaS product is completely virtualized. The foundation of the brands that we've connected with, the best brands, their hottest products constantly rotated through with your logo. From a sales standpoint, the customer always wants to know, what is it, how much is it, when can I have it? In a branded space where you have giveaways or you're doing a golf tournament, it just gets crazy. From all the merch you see and everything you get in touch with, the number of variables when you bring them together is just very challenging. Here you can see a retail product. This is a crystal decanter that's been laser engraved. The virtualization also in the product specifications show you, this is the retail box. You can go now to Total Wine and get this, or Don can go right here, 50 bucks, and he can have it in his shopping cart made. If he was gonna try and get some shirts, here's one with a pocket. He wants to get a ladies. Here's one for the ladies, complimentary colors. This is actually a product that it surfaced because it was using the keywords from his website bomb with all the laptops and video chat. And if we go to the cart, all these products will be manufactured and delivered to him just in time. Let's see. Carpool Logistics is showing a landing page. These are private stores launched without their complete and total knowledge. Uh, <laughs> And if you get in, you're gonna see, this is a challenging one, super challenging. They're gonna pull available assets that are related to logistics, but it's, it's a little bit cumbersome. The knowledge graph is probably gonna say, this is a software company and AI CS code pulling that up, but logistics is pulling and elevating the Carhartt brand, because that may be what a logistics company would think was most appealing. But from top to bottom, a private experience really giving you a visualization that does the pre-flight for what it's gonna look like if we deliver it to you, can add it to the cart. The buttons are different. I don't have enough time to go for YouTube, but I did give you a little QR code to take home and give you something. <laughs> so you get into the cart, but we're an end-to-end -end solution, so we do have to manufacture. We figured that out too. We've partnered with companies that have latent technology to manufacture. And so the end-to-end -end branded solution powered by a suite of technologies and the demo ends with a physical good that I brought for them to take home today. There are no questions so I can go home because I'm super nervous. All right, right here, first hand. The question is, can I walk you through the experience? 
Our goal is to incept you with a store. When you have thought about wanting a branded store, it already exists. We're using SSO to try and use a single sign-on. Let's say you're on the Google or you're on the LinkedIn or any of the others. We're going to try and immediately go to your brand and elevate if you have an SVG or anything. If you have garbage assets, we'll try and enhance them. And we want to show you the experience is, this is where we got. Is this good? Is it not good? See it, improve it. Um, if we're working with streamers, a lot of the time on, on their, you know, the NIL store, you have to monetize that moment and get that exact the custom items. It depends on who you are, what's available for you, but it begins by showing you and we go from there and elevate and refine for what you need. The question is, how long does it take to stand up a store? Currently, we're following the Salesforce AI model where all of our tools do a man in the middle so we don't get in trouble with big brands because people will come in here and put in major licenses that we don't play with. Um, so it, right now, the whole thing start to finish is about an hour with a man in the middle. And we're hoping to, to get that down to about 45 seconds. So the question is, what kind of admin tools exist on the back, back end for, for all of the particulars of maintaining inventories and brands? And that's really where we abandon Shopify. I mean, their leaky bucket AI algorithm is a nightmare that somebody asks, like, what do you scream about? Like, I wake up with panic attacks about, like, I've been shut out from their API again. Um, Yes. So an example would be a restaurant is going to need, the manager has a new hire kit. New hires only see that page for when they're signed on. Their merch wall shows retail prices and that reporting module re reports revenue to them and profits as they maintain. Something that only Bridgestone Golf can develop their own golf balls and print them because it's part of the manufacturing process. You have to buy those and case them and warehousing is a component in the back end and there's good management tools. In the back. What do you charge and what is the revenue model? Yeah. Um, uh, off the shelf, yeah, we are a real startup. Like, we would love to win today and be here and learn how to do all that real well. Um, what are you driving? You know, it, it, it is on the enterprise tools that you need. If you need a, a punch out CXML connection for a Coupa and you need to be in Granger, we charge you where we have to spend more money on our product. Our biggest customers are dictating our growth right now, but currently the stores are deployed at a zero cost model and that's our goal for now. SaaS features, microservices, the, there's a whole approach to that. What would you do with the money? I'm gonna take the question as an investment question. Um, we are a software company and we do have a laboratory that was our machine manufacturing those goods. If you got, gave us money today, we would hire more developers. We can make more noise. If you know somebody that has a major brand, like we're in with Under Armour, we're in with Nike, but Patagonia's really touchy. Maybe with that money we could do more promotions and become more visible and bring in more brands. We wanna complete the solution and build out all the, uh, the tools to automate and get into some industries that I would be very interested offsite to discuss. The question is, what are the shipping times? We constantly talk about what we are internally, and we want to be not only exciting, but contagious. We want to be not only like the hottest brands, but like the hottest products from those brands, constantly rotating it. And it's not necessarily that we're fast or we're slow, but we're communicating the speed of that so that as you're building consensus in your team, you can come to a consensus based on your needs and as they change. So we're trying to communicate when you're going to have it more than just being fast. But I hope to be a thought leader in the branded goods space. And if you talk to all of the competitors, I don't know of anyone else that's like, right now is good for me. Like, why is the pizza on the way, but your corksicle mug isn't? Like, why can't we do it in half an hour? Why can't I get with, ride with Jax and have a guy dashing across town for you? I mean, a pizza takes seven and a half minutes in the oven. That was seven seconds. I don't know where the excuses are, so. Yes. 
Please repeat the question. We're out of time. Um, yeah, the, the question is how can we segment? A, um, a restaurant usually has about nine different stores. Owner, management, new hires, merch wall, uh, rewards and incentive programs. My dream is to have like a, a claw machine that's powered by swag rewards and you like, it, uh, I, solutions for individuals and individual company customization. All right. Let's give it up for Merchant.ai. Give it up. Y'all are bringing the heat today. Yes. Making Man. them work for this. All right, so we've got two matching t-shirts and I've got a fun little prompt for you. So I want to know who networked today. So who can raise their hand and tell me about one person that you met and point them out in the crowd? I love it that she was like. I'll go over to you. All right, here's a t-shirt and then who did you meet today? Point them out. Don! You get a t-shirt. Don doesn't get a t-shirt. Like, it needs to be someone like, else. You didn't meet anyone else? I know you met someone. There's your new friend, so now you two have to connect afterwards and meet one another. I didn't love really that. go as planned, but it never does, right? I Ever, love never, that. never does. Good job. Good so job, now we made new friends. We that's made it work for that's us. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And if anyone's looking for a co-founder, or you're looking for investors, or you just want to just create a community of founders that you can lean on and talk to, this is what this is all about. And I'm telling you, like I lean on a lot of people that are in this room. We, Me too. Yeah. We eat together. We drink together. It's it's good times. Um, but also cry to together. Cry to God. And you know, talked about our 42 no's in 2022, that neither here nor there. <laughs> but, um, you ready? Yeah. Are you good, sir? Ready to go? All right. All right, let's get, get it up with a quickie. With quickie. Woo Come on, guys, get the energy. Yes. Testing. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed the, um, the networking event um, next door. I have a quick question. Uh, how many people were you able to connect with today? I want you to just put that number in your head. I'm going to assume there's a couple hundred people in here. I'll keep it at even 300. Question, how many people were you unable to connect with today? I want you to put that number in your head. Now, I'm going to bet that on average, most of you weren't able in that 30 minutes that we had over there with all these people to talk to six people. So this is what happened. There were, you talked to about 2% of the people in the room, and you might have missed out on an investor, a friend, a co-founder, a customer, a partner. And whenever we walk out that door, you're are gonna to struggle to meet that person again. Now, I forgot to say this. See this little guy right here? That's me. I want you to think about whether or not you met me today. Well, let me introduce myself. My name is Don Charlton. I'm the founder and CEO of Quickie. Formerly, I created a company called Jazz HR in 2008. We grew it to 20 million in revenue. We sold it for 180 million. Today, I'm an active investor in the companies you see at the bottom there. I've put a couple million dollars into different tech companies, and you did not meet me today. And I have to leave right after this meeting because I gotta go somewhere. So I'm not gonna be able to meet today. I could have been your customer, could have been your friend, mentor, advisor, investor, partner, but in 30 minutes, you're not gonna be able to meet with all these people in this room, right? And in fact, all those advisors, co-founders, investors, and you name it that are in this room that you didn't connect with, they're not connections now. And you know, the reason for that is professional networking doesn't, it never has. We have been going to events where there are hundreds or thousands of people for years knowing that we tell our friends, I actually met with two people, I got three good connections. You 90% plus of every meeting, every networking event you ever go to, you don't meet most of the people. It doesn't scale in person, as I just mentioned. It doesn't scale on LinkedIn. We all know that we ignore in-mails and connection requests because your little avatar doesn't tell me who you are. And we can't give all of the people that we connect with 30 minutes to catch up. It doesn't scale. And as a result, all those misconnections, including all of the ones that you didn't make tonight, might be full of missed opportunities. What if there was a world where this network didn't disappear? What if there was a world where this network lived on after this meeting? And in fact, as more and more people came to Startup Villages, the network got bigger and the network was still accessible to you. Well, 
I'm trying to build a platform where all of these people, as this, as this network grows, are still accessible to you long after Startup 91, Startup Village 92, Startup Village 93, and so forth. So what if you could connect more conveniently, frequently, and effectively with your entire professional network? Well, that's Quickie, asynchronous video networking for professionals. It'll help you connect, reconnect, and stay connected with everyone in your network using the efficiency and authenticity of something that you can only do in the last few years in the browser, record and send short video messages. Let's go to a demo real quick. I'm gonna show you very quickly how Quickie works. First, there's two sides to it. There's private networks that can be hosted on our platform, and there's also the, uh, the, the account that you have where you manage all of your connections that you make from different networks. So any network, Atlanta Tech Village now has a Quickie network for Startup Village. You can come in and you can record a greeting. Hey, I'm Don Charlton. I'm the uh, founder and CEO. So now, instead of me being that weird, random little icon in my LinkedIn where I, you saw my founder face, I look like an asshole, right? Um, you can actually get a greeting for who I really am as a person, right? So now you can browse prof profiles of different people inside of this platform, including if you want to connect with somebody, you record a 30-second greeting to somebody. And a 30-second greeting now is instead of just an avatar, it's someone who might want to hey, connect. Hey, My name is Mitch. I'm part of a media group putting together a roundtable discussion about the startup scene. So you see here, that's how you make new connections on Quickie. And then whenever you want to actually stay in touch with your network, all of your new connections come into the platform. You're able to monitor the conversations you've had back and forth with people. And then lastly, you're also able to connect your email accounts so you can actually stay connected through video messages with all of your connections from your email as well. Um, we're not raising money right now, but we will raise optimistically. Founder and CEO, we're, we have um, a, a, good, a, good, um, a good set of uh, customers in our pipeline. Atlanta Tech Village hopefully will be one of them someday. And thank you very much. I had a quick question I forgot to say um, at the end. This is the QR code. If you want to help me create the network for, for Atlanta Tech Village today, if you want this network to live on. The question is, how do you plan to prevent abuse? Well, the way that we do that is, if you join a network, you have the ability to turn on or off new connections and also people who are not connected messaging you. So you can basically just be in the network and just choose when you wanna connect with people or make yourself available. When you connect with somebody, you only get 30 seconds to send them a video message. So if, if there's business or partnership or something that we can have, you only get 30 seconds, so give me your best possible pitch. Yes. Yeah, the question was, I saw somebody on probation. What the hell was that? Um, if, you, if you manage a network, and think about any type of network. It could be a network. It could be your company with 300 people, and you're trying to use it for onboarding. It could be an alumni association, any type of network. You're going to have some bad actors per what he said. So for some reason, what I just did didn't prevent that person from sending someone every, a, a unique video and spamming them to try to sell them something. I can put them on probation. And if, I, if they do it again, I can ban them. So there's a lot of good admin controls around managing members and so forth. Right there in the back. The question is how much? Uh, kind of working on that right now. It's, it, the, the model is it's free to use um, for individuals. You pay for premium things like longer recording times or branded video, personal video messages when you reach out to your network. If you're paying for a network, it starts at $1.99 per month, and then it goes up based on whether or not it's free for small networks. It, at $1.99 per month, you get, more act, you get more members on the platform, and also you get custom branding. So it's a pretty simple model. Right here. So the question is, are you selling to individuals and companies? Um, the short answer is both. And the way we're doing it is our, our growth model is we're going after networks so we can get a bunch of end users. So we make money from the networks whenever they choose to either have a large network or they want to brand the network because they don't want it to have our generic quickie branding. And then once all those people come in, remember, you might be a member of an alumni group. You might be a member of your company network. You might be a member of Atlanta Tech Village. As you go into our, 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 your platform where you're managing all your connections from those different networks, let's say if you want to use our platform to send out 
video messages to people, you then can pay as an individual to brand it for your company or for your particular whatever personal branding is. So there's two different ways to make money. Right there. Yeah. So the question is, what is the value add for networks um, to use our existing platforms? Um, you're, nobody's fucking networking in your network. It go, it, basically, every LinkedIn group should use this platform because LinkedIn, if you go to a LinkedIn group, the only thing you can do is spam at the top of the list, right? My argument to the world is I don't really think that networking has ever really been done effectively because we, we you pay for a conference for where they, they promote that there's going to be 10,000 people there, and whenever you go in the room, you, you didn't talk to me today because I ran into my friend Derek. And Derek and I talked, yeah, there he is. And we, we talked for about 20 minutes, so I didn't have a chance to talk to anybody. So I actually don't think that, I think the biggest challenge we have is um, people not feeling like there's an overlap with some existing networking tools that they might have. Because there are like some kind of tools for being able to like, you know, create a directory of avatars, little descriptions, and basically things that are not really that, um, in my opinion, engaging. Yes. Guys, so the question is, how long do the videos exist? We are going to build an ephemeral um, option if you maybe just want to maybe send a message and you don't want it to exist forever. Right now, they do exist forever, but we have a lot of security controls around, like, um, uh, you can send private videos to people, you can create public videos and so forth. So there's a lot of control around that. And also, you can always delete a video if you want to. We might do burn after watching as well as an option as well. Got it. Okay, so the question is, as we scale, you have very large networks on the platform. How do you stop people from abusing the platform? Well, there's one thing that we hope is kind of inherently baked in there. To connect with somebody, aka spam them, you have to decide to record. You can't upload a video, a 30-second video for that person. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, we'll take detectors. If somebody gets flagged as a spammer, we'll, we'll, we'll factor that in. Um, and um, quite frankly, we have to get to scale before we really understand some of the ways that people abuse. I started a recruiting software company, and I didn't know until after I scaled that people would create fake jobs that were targeting executives and then try to sell them Rolex watches once they got their email address. So we'll kind of figure that stuff out as we scale. Yeah. Right there. So, yeah, so the question is, um, what are the um, appropriate use cases for Quickie, and are there any inappropriate use cases? I mean, I'd, I'd say that's going to be on a per-network basis. So you can imagine um, each person is going to communicate the reason. But we're, like in the platform, you can actually communicate who you want to connect with and so forth. And if that's, I'm looking for investors, yeah, you can reach out to somebody for an investment. If you're just looking for a friend, you can reach out to somebody for a friend. But if you're, let's say if uh, you put in your rules for your member network, this is not for dating. So don't, to your point of, of abusing it, don't reach out to somebody because you think that they're hot, right, on our platform. Right. Well, on that note, let's give it up for Quickie. That's not for dating. It's not for dating. All right. It's not for dating, Kristen. It's not for dating. <laughs> Good disclaimer. All right, can we just have a round of applause for all of our presenters today? Great job. So Christian is going to pull up the Slideo. So this is how we're going to vote. So pull out your cell phones. I'll give it to you now at slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And she'll throw it up here, but the code is ATLSV91. So ATL Atlanta, SV Startup Village, 91. And again, I'll be up there. In a, oh, it's right there for you guys to see. So while we are waiting to get it up, and active, I've got another giveaway. This t-shirt says, support entrepreneurs. So I would like someone with a show of hands to tell me how they have supported another founder. And Over the poll here. is live. The poll is live. <laughs> Slido.com, a code ATLSV91 on your screen. 
Hi, I'm Eric Edelman with Bigger Cup Consulting. I'm a business coach. I support founders and entrepreneurs every single day. Work mainly with 10 to 100 person startups. Thank you for supporting. All right, so here we are. Christian, how much longer do we have for voting? That's a great question. Tiandras, how long, much longer do we have for voting? Do we have Jeopardy music? All right. While we're Jeopardy musicking. <laughs> that was awful. Thanks, Allie. I Sorry. <laughs> I liked it. Yes. Uh, hey, y'all. I'm Allie Merritt. I'm the managing director here at Atlanta Tech Village. If you have not been here before, thank you for coming tonight. We are the fourth largest tech hub in the U.S. Woo! We are partnered with a ton of other fantastic hubs in town who are working on not only proprietary technology, which is what we do, but technology in a variety of ways. And thank you, John, from ATDC being here today is one of our other Woo! fantastic hubs here in town. We have, we have one more person, too, from ATDC. Where's my other ATDC Bob. version? Yes, sir. Thank you. I say this to say you're not just joining a community of one hub when you join a community here. You're joining multiple hubs. We're collaborative. We are here to support you. We all want Atlanta and Atlanta startups to be better. So if you came out tonight and you're like, I think you, you asked everybody to point out, are you a founder or you want to be a founder? If you haven't found that right home, come see me. Come see John. Come see some of the other hubs here in town because we are here to support you and help get all of y'all onto this stage too. All right. How much time we got left? Dun, dun, you got? Dun, dun, all right. Dun, Thanks y'all. I don't know. <laughs> da, 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 da. Merch shop. All right. Merchshop.ai. Congratulations. You have won two hot desks and a year of parking here at Atlanta Tech Village. Welcome home. Awesome. Give it up. And before you all get up, we're going to take a selfie. Yes. My arms aren't very long, but uh, if you guys can stage real quick with us for this selfie. We're going to use one of your tall arms. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everybody. Everybody, everybody. Come on up. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. We Woo! do this every other month. So our next one, what's this, June? Will be August. It's the last Monday. All right. So you hold the phone. Everybody in the audience, y'all got to look excited, too. No, Come we're on. Doing it this way. So you guys are all in our selfie. Y'all in the audience, you're yeah, in the selfie, too. Tall Get in here, you guys. Don't fall off the back of the stage, please. Don't fall off the stage. God bless us. God bless us. Lift it up so we get everyone in the crowd. Village! Okay. And I need one more. Sorry, y'all. You gotta lift this one more time. One, two, three. Thank y'all for coming out tonight. Thanks for coming.